So we're still with the name Muhammad or the title Muhammad or the reference to Muhammad. And we're looking at it and we're trying to find out its sequence right through history. Now, at some point, this title Muhammad, which is the anointed one or the blessed one or the praised one, uh, the altogether lovely, these are all the different translations for this word in both Hebrew and in Aramaic and, and, and then eventually into Arabic. At some point, that Muhammad, uh, just four letters, then became the word Muhammad. So I think what you're going to do now is you're going to look through some of that sequence, are you not, Mel? I am, yeah, and I think it's kind of uh, key that people understand that once it became vocalized as Muhammad, then people lost the connection with the early form of it. And actually, some Muslims can't even recognize Mahmud. They don't see how it's connected to Muhammad. So it's actually very useful if you want to hide the origins of the of the name. So I'm going to share my slides with you. Okay. Right. So I'm going to start with uh, Karl Heinz Oleg. Um, he basically says that Mahmud was just one of a number of titles rather than a specific name. And this is going to be really key. He says in other sources cited by Ibn Said in the same chapter, up to six other names are mentioned of which Muhammad was only one. According to Ibn Sa'd, six names were reported in two sources. In other sources, it is three and five names. According to them, the prophet himself said that he had six names. Muhammad, the blessed praised one, Ahmed, the highly praised one, Hatim, the seal, Hasir, the awakener of the dead, Akib, the last prophet or concluder, and Mahi, the redeemer of sins, also the one who is awakened to life, the eraser of sins. All of these are theologically significant names which would fundamentally fit Jesus more easily than an Arabian prophet. So in those sources, um, it's basically, they're not referring to Muhammad exclusively. It's he, it's just one name or one title among six other titles. That's the, the point. Do you want to come back on any of this? No, this is good. I'm, 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 you've got my attention now. I like this because this is something that we have, we have said over and over and over again. You need to look at the etymological support. You need to look at the, the, the references that are that are from that time period and that's exactly where Oleg is going and now where you're following okay so further on in his book he says that Alois Springer uh, should be agreed with when he concludes with reference to the reports in Ibn Said in these traditions Muhammad appears in the same way as the rest of the other names as an epithet of the prophet and not as a proper name so that is absolutely huge to sum up Alois Springer already opined that Muhammad was a title and not a proper name so this is something you've been saying something I've been saying for a long time um, a lot of Muslims consider Muhammad to be a name but actually it, it was just an epithet originally yeah absolutely I use Alois Springer in my doctoral thesis refer to him all the time because he was really an academic in his time period and that's why I'm glad to see Oleg is quoting him and as agreeing with him that this is a title, not a proper name. Proof again that these scholars, these German scholars are way ahead of the game. They see it before the rest of the world sees it. And that's important that they were writing this, uh, that, that they were writing this in the century, uh, not just this century. Now, Oleg is writing in this century, but he's quoting those who come from much, much further earlier than that. So this is not new material you're bringing up. This is actually well known, but no one really listened to these scholars we need to listen to them today because they are linguists and they're looking at it etymolo etymologically. Absolutely. Now, if we look at this, this is uh, from uh, Professor Robert Kerr. He says, we can get all the versions of Muhammad from Mahmud, but we can't from Muhammad. So if we look at Mahmud, the first one on the top, which you would typically find in places like Turkey, uh, Makometis, which is the Latin form of it, uh, again, you could trace it back to Mahmed. Mahomet, which you would find in France. So you, if you go back a few centuries ago, you'll find writings with Mahomet and then Muhammad, as we find today. What we don't find is that these names can be traced back to Muhammad. 
what does that tell us? It tells us that actually originally it was Mahmud that was used and later it got focalized to Muhammad. And uh, maybe there's reasons why it got focalized in that specific way. Um, but at some point the tradition split and the other early version of Mahmud carried on in in different localities. Um, and uh, I think a lot of Muslims today don't even recognize the word Mahmud as being connected to Muhammad. Um, and that's kind of useful if you're trying to hide the fact that this was um, a title, a name that goes back centuries before Muhammad, especially when it shows up in inscriptions like the Jewish inscription in the year 523, way down in Yemen, uh, which is kind of um, interesting, let's say, because it, it exposes the fact that the, the story of how Islam began is, is, is obviously not historically accurate. So listen, before you go on, are, are you saying that this is the sequence from Mehmet to Mahometes to Muhammad and then to Muhammad? Is that the sequence or that they all four exist simultaneously? Yeah, no, they, that they, they've all each independently of each other have developed from the original Mahmet. That's what I meant to say by this. Okay. Yeah. So the fact that there are many different derivations of it suggests that Muhammad, the one we do know today, is just one of four derivations, nothing more than that. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, which means that what, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, Mahmud came first. That's that's what it proves. And the fact that the traditions, like, for example, in Turkey, you have Mahmud still means that the tradition of referring to Mahmud must have lasted fairly, fairly long into history. Um, yeah. You know, because otherwise they would just use the word Muhammad and not have Mahmud. So I think that's kind of key. Which is fascinating because the references in Thomas the Thomas the Presbyter have that Mehmet, the Persian spelling, and that he's a Lachmed, which means he has to be from northern Iraq. Even yes. way up in the north, not at the down in the south. Absolutely. And of course, you know, Turkey is just right next door to there. Uh it makes perfect sense, you know. Good yeah. stuff. Okay, so a little bit more from uh, Oleg. Uh, this is absolutely amazing stuff. He says the term Muhammad Jesus was current up until 750 AD. Now, if we think back to what we're saying about the Quran, we're saying that uh, the Quran seems to be referring to Jesus when it talks of Muhammad. Well, according to Oleg, um, the, the term Muhammad Jesus uh, was being used in the early days. So he says, here the Messiah is Jesus, son of Mary, Isa ibn Maryam, Muhammad, servant of God, Abdallah, prophet, messenger, the word and spirit of God. At least up until this time, i.e. around 700 AD, probably even until 750 AD, the term Muhammad Jesus was current. Now, I'd love to know where, what he's basing this on. I'd love to see the sources, but I think that is huge. And indicates that there is a, a very different story about the early days of Islam than what we have today. Um, I think we could probably reference, you know, the coins, for example, that have crosses with Muhammad um, together. So if the term Muhammad Jesus was being used, that makes perfect sense with the coins, you know, it, it, whereas if we just accept the standard Islamic narrative, narrative then it, it doesn't make sense. I don't know if you want to come in on that. Well, absolutely. I mean, this is huge. I mean, you could just we could just do a whole episode just on this one reference right here. If this continued that Muhammad was Jesus all the way up until the mid 8th century, then anything that comes prior to that now suddenly makes sense. Are you are you figuring? I mean, stop and think. Remember the coin of of Mu'uya, the 663 coin that continued right up until 680. There you see a picture. Here, I'll put a picture of it right up here. Here you have the coin, and you see that Mu'uya's image is here. He's holding a cross. He has a cross above his head. On the back side, you have the letter M, and there's a cross above it, and there's the Muhammad, M-H-M-D. And we've always said, how could Muhammad of Arabia, how could the Islamic Muhammad be having a cross? And how could the caliph that's introducing this praise what have be a Christian? It's obviously he's a Christian, unless, of course, that Muhammad is a title for Jesus. 
Hankind's Oleg is saying, yes, that is a title for Jesus. Now let's jump to 696, or sorry, 692, and let's jump to Abdul Malik, who introduces it on the Dome of the Rock and on the coins there as well, where he has the Shahada, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and he's attacking Jesus and all these inscriptions, attacking the divinity of Jesus, attacking the Trinity, he's attacking his sonship, and then he says, for truly, the God is only one, and the praise one, of course, the praise one would have to be the, who he's referring to in the other inscriptions. Jesus is nothing more than a prophet or a messenger. So there is the uh, there it is in 691 on the coins and on the Dome of the Rock. Now let's go to John of Damascus into 8th century. We're now at 730. This is good well into the 8th century. This is another 20 years before what he's saying here. And there you have John of Damascus, who's right there in the in Damascus. He's right in the caliph courts as the Quran is being written, right there as he's there. Remember, he was there during the time of Abdul Malik. He was there during the time of Al Al Walid. He writes this book called "The Heresy of the Ishmaelites," using Ishmaelites and not Muslim at this time. And what's fascinating, he refers to Muhammad again. But this Muhammad, who come from with these odd doctrines. So this Muhammad, this person of Jesus Christ, in this case, is you're changing him. This is not the Jesus I know is what he's saying. And he has four books. And these four books are the book of the cow, the book of the table, the book of women, and the book of the camel. No, 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 no. Those three, three of them are in the current Quran today, but not the book of the camel. So even this character who he knows as the original Jesus, he's now being transformed into a new Muhammad who's coming with a complete new book, which is still not yet complete. It's only made up of four books. Today, it's now 114. So we can see the evolution of this. This is 20 years before what Karl Heinz Oleg is referring to. But it fits the coins, it fits the inscription, and it also fits the documents that John of Damascus is writing. So this all fits together now. It all comes to a piece. Great stuff. I'm, I'm glad to see that the Germans are on top of this. Absolutely. So in conclusion, then, um, what, what are we getting from all of this? So Mahmoud functioned both as a reference to God and to Jesus. It seemed to apply to God in the 6th century Jewish inscription that we saw earlier, or to perhaps to a contemporary Jewish figure. It applied to Jesus in the 7th century coins. It applied to Jesus in the Quran. It was used as a messianic uh, epithet. Uh, and I would argue this later got reinterpreted and applied to an Arabian prophet. Vestiges of the earlier meaning are still evident in the Islamic traditions that refer to Adam being created from the light of Muhammad, as we saw in the last episode. So uh, that's sort of my conclusion based on all of the evidence that we've looked at so far. <laughs> This is a great conclusion. I love where you're going with this. And this is good stuff. I hope people are listening to this. It looks like this Muhammad title. It looks like this title of Muhammad, the praise one, the anointed one, uh, the, uh, the the Messiah, even in some cases, the, uh, the altogether lovely. All of these references are referring to Jesus in the Old Testament, Jesus in the New Testament. And as you're seeing here, even the Jesus is Muhammad all the way up until around 750. This this person, Muhammad, this altogether praised one, is Jesus. And I, I'm glad to see the Germans are on top of this. I'm glad to see that they're bringing this up for us. And I'm really happy to see how we can now, now understand why these references to Muhammad are right through the 7th and 8th century and earlier. Why? Because the title Muhammad was well known. It was well used. At some point, he does become the prophet of Arabia. But it looks like if we're up to 750, that's when the Abbasids come into power. Isn't it at 750 where they take over from the Umayyads and they eradicate and throw out everything the Umayyads have done, including all these references and all these writings? I mean, they've all been destroyed. These writings of Abdul Malik and al Wadid and before that, Mu'awiyah and Marwan, all of them have been destroyed. We have nothing to know except the rocks, the coins, and the inscriptions, which if you put it together, it looks like every one of these inscriptions and these rocks and these coins are referring to the Muhammad, the praised one who is Jesus. The Abbasids then in 750, what do they do? They eradicate, destroy. We know this very clearly with, with what the story we have with Al-Buhari. He was given uh, 600,000 of these stories, and he threw out 98% of them and only retained 2%. The 2% he chained, ooh, there go the balloons. Let's wait for the balloons to go. And 
<laughs> and only retain two percent. I love it when the balloons go up and only retain two percent of the of the ninety eight percent. And because of that, you can see even the balloons are understanding what we're saying. They see what's going on here. They basically wholesale destroyed everything that the Umayyads were referring to. And any reference to Jesus as Muhammad, they threw out, took out, and replaced it with Muhammad the prophet, their prophet. They needed a prophet because they needed a prophetic line. They needed a revelation because a prophet has to have a revelation. So this is an Abbasid invention, and it looks like the Muhammad that we now know today is an Abbasid Muhammad because the dates seem to suggest that. Yeah. Oleg's right on that. I think the Germans yeah. knew before that. It's just that we needed to take it and we need to publicize it. Yeah, go, yeah. come back on that, Mel. Yeah. I do I do want to bring in something. We, we found out from the Chinese sources that are, you know, thousands of miles away when they got their invoice from the Tayaye, which were the the people who lived in Iraq, they came twice different periods. But they noticed when the envoy came in the 750s, the key period, they said they now had a different foundation story of the Tayaye. The story had changed. And so what did they do? They wrote down both stories and they just said, well, we don't know which is the correct story, but there's, we're now, there's this Muhammad being introduced in, in the 750. So it's interesting the Chinese sources picked up on that too. Just exactly what you were saying. Wow. So here we, and here's the great thing. For those of you who don't know why we are, are why are we giving uh, credence to the Chinese sources? Because the Chinese sources were not eradicated. They did, the, the Abbasids did not have control over the Chinese sources. That's why they're another window, another uh, light into the seventh and eighth century that is so distant from Islam, the Islam could not have destroyed their writings, and that's why we need to look at them because they give us another, uh, yep, yeah, another window into what was happening in the seventh and eighth century. And they're noticing this. If they're noticing this, then we need to notice this. Good stuff, great. I, I love it. Uh, this is what we need to hear. It's more of this kind of material uh, that we need to look at. As we've said over and over again, forget about the ninth and tenth century. These are all Abbasid, their story, their narrative. Forget about them. They're written too late. Let's go back to the 7th century. Let's go back to the 8th century. Let's go back to these references. Let's go back to the Siddha. And let's also go back to these Chinese sources. And what do we find? It looks like that the, the whole narrative of who this Muhammad was, when he, what he became, was we have to lay at the feet of the Abbasids. Good stuff. Thanks so much. God bless you, Mel, uh, Mel over there in Ireland. And for those of you who are listening, do come up with your response. You've got the box right below. Let's hear what you have to say. Uh, this is Mel and Jay. 3,000 miles apart, for now.